So 10 years ago, I made a decision while I was teaching a class that now that I look back on this decision, I'm not exactly sure if it was the right call at the time. So it was 2005, and I was supposed to teach a lesson about forgiveness to a group of seventh graders. And I thought to myself, you know, it's one thing to talk about forgiveness in theory, but could I do something in the class that could actually make at least one or two or three people pretty angry? And then we could talk about forgiveness, not just in theory, but in practice. And so I really was trying to think about what that would be. So here's what I decided to do. I get to class and I pass out decks of cards to everybody and I say, here's what we're going to do. We're all going to try to build the tallest uh, card castle, if you know what I'm talking about. It's where you take a deck of cards and you just stack them up like this and you put a first row down, then a second, then a third, and you, you just kind of build it up. So I said, we're just going to have a contest, see which one of you has the best steady hands. And so I turned on some nice music and I just let them start going. Well, about 20 or 25 minutes later, this one particular guy, he had a great tower going on. And it was like, you know, a five, four, three, two tower. And I waited to the moment where he was putting those last two cards on the table. <laughs> and I walk over and I say, wow, that is a, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to knock your tower over. So that's, you know, in theory, I thought this was going to go really well. This kid is a uh, seventh grade football player. <laughs> Biggest kid in the seventh grade. And uh, he starts shaking with rage. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> I forgot. Seventh graders can't control their emotions. No joke. This guy runs and just levels me. Like he just slams, slams the youth minister into the ground. Now you might be saying, how, you know, how do you let a seventh grader tackle you? I'm telling you, it was a big guy. It's, it wasn't my fault. You know, I learned that day that, you know, forgiveness, it's, it's fairly easy to explain. But it's, it's actually pretty hard when you're actually trying to experience it, when you're trying to live it out. Just a few uh, weeks ago, one of my friends who's a counselor told me that the oldest client uh, this person ever saw was a woman in her late 70s. And she would always drive from the panhandle of Oklahoma uh, down to the city to meet with this counselor. And my friend said that the reason this woman kept driving uh, month after month after month is because 50, 60 years ago, this woman's mother had said some things to her uh, which she still couldn't forgive. And so for 50 or 60 years, this woman just let these early childhood experiences just fester. You see, forgiveness, it's easy to explain, but it's actually pretty difficult to experience and to practice. So this year... For four weeks now, we're, we've been in this series called Renew. It's a New Year series. The whole idea is God doesn't just want to give you an afterlife. He wants to give you a better life. And so each week, we're, we're trying to teach you and study with you ways that you can become closer to the person that God actually wants you to be. And so the first week, we talked about that, that perhaps the, the biggest thing that's keeping you from being that person is maybe you're not aware of the bondage that you're actually in. And just like the prodigal son, we have to come to our senses. Second week, we talked about that maybe what, what it is for you is that it could be that Satan is, is whispering some lie into your life, and you need to figure out what that lie is and refute it with truth. Or last week, we talked about the power of renewing your mind. And so this week, the conclusion of the series, I want to talk about the idea that, that sometimes to get renewal, we need to acknowledge our own bondage, but other times to get renewal, we have to acknowledge that we've been hurt. And it's really hard to know what exactly we're supposed to do with hurt. Maybe for you it's kind of like that the lady who was in her 70s. Maybe something happened to you a long, long, long time ago. But you can't go one day without bringing the memories back. Or maybe you've had some, some friendship and you were really close to a person and maybe you told this person something in confidence and that person shared your secret and your reputation was ruined and you don't know if you can forgive this person or not. Or maybe you, you had a spouse and for years you were married to this person and 10 or 15 or 20 years after you married that person, then something from the past came up and you didn't have a clue about it. And you find yourself hurt not knowing if you will ever find the power within you to forgive your spouse for what they did to you. See, forgiveness is 
pretty hard. The well, good news is that when you read Scripture, I find this fascinating. When you, especially the New Testament, when you read the New Testament, there's actually more the Bible has to the Bible has to say to people who have been offended than to those who have committed the offense. So, for example, when Jesus talked in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, um, you know, if someone strikes you on the cheek, he says, turn to him the other as well. Well, Jesus doesn't have any words to say to the person that actually slapped you. His words are for those who have been slapped and who have been offended. And over and over, when you read Scripture, there are so many passages which are specifically meant to help people who have been betrayed, hurt, rejected, and abandoned. And so if you'll turn with me, I want to look at one short little passage in the book of Ephesians. Paul's writing some really practical words to to the Ephesian church, and he says this in verse 26. He says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now I'm reading this the other day, and I really get fascinated by that word foothold. Because when I think foothold, I think like rock climber, and I'm climbing up a wall, and I'm trying to get my foot on a hold. And when my foot's on that hold, that means I can climb up further on the wall. But I started to think they probably didn't have rock walls back 2,000 years ago. So what exactly does that word really mean? And so I looked up that word foothold in the Greek, and, and really what it means, it just means room or place. So, for example, when Jesus is born, it says they couldn't find any room for them in the inn. That's the same word as foothold. Or later in John 14, when Jesus says, I'm going there to heaven to prepare a place for you, it's the same word. And so in Ephesians 4, what Paul is suggesting is that you have the power to give the devil room in your mind. You see, Satan wants to camp out and live rent-free in the middle of your head. And you've got the key to give him access to do that. So two years ago, 2014, there was a Walmart in Texas and a worker found some strange trash in the break room. There was some banana peels, there was some open cereal boxes, and it didn't seem like anything that any of his co-workers would have done. And so he did some investigating and kind of followed this trash trail back throughout the store. And it took him to the aisle where the strollers were. And he pushed two strollers to the side. And he found that somebody had actually made a home inside Walmart. Turned out to be a 14-year-old kid. This kid had got mad at his family. He didn't know where to go. And so he just found his self on the baby aisle and he had had this blue sleeping bag. He got lots of food. He had several changes of clothes that he had stolen from Walmart and so he would change into various clothes and when he walked throughout the day that would keep people from thinking he was the same boy. He was really scared of going to the bathroom and so he would wear diapers while he slept and while he hung out in his little makeshift home. They found out that this boy had lived at Walmart unnoticed for four days. And so everybody started asking these questions. First of all, what what would possess this boy to do this? And they talked to the family and figured out it was a broken home situation. But the second question that people were wondering is, how does someone live in Walmart for four days without anybody knowing? Well, there's actually an answer to that question. Number one, the kid had access. And number two, the kid had food. How does Satan live in your brain, even though you don't want him there? Number one, he gets access. And what's fascinating in Ephesians 4 is is what Paul tells us about the access. Satan doesn't get access, at least in this particular passage, because of pride or because of greed or because of lust or some other sexual sin. The way that Satan gets access to your mind is unresolved anger. And if you've got it, he's going to get in. And do you know how he stays? Well, in the same way that the boy can stay in Walmart for four days because he has food, Satan can stay in your mind as long as you feed him and you feed him by holding a grudge. You see, holding a grudge, it's really easy to do and it has devastating effects on the people that do it for the long haul. So, for example, I came across a study the other day. It was in the Journal of Behavioral Science. A guy named Lauren... Tour Saint did this study, and he, what he did is he took 1,500 people ages, they were in their 60s and 70s, 
And what he did is he gave them surveys which, which measured how, they, how their attitude was towards forgiveness. So on the one side of the survey, there were certain people that were, they, were, they had let it go. They had, they had trusted that God uh, was going to take care of the people who had offended them. And they were living and practicing forgiveness. Well, on the other end of the scale, as he measured their attitudes towards forgiveness, he, he found the people that they were holding on to the grudge. And these were the people that they would think about it every day. They would think about how much they had been hurt, how much they had been betrayed, and they, they just couldn't let it go. And so what, what this researcher did is he kept studying these people in their 60s and 70s over about a 10-year period, and, he, uh, and many of them passed away. And what he was trying to figure out is, is there any relationship to when you pass away and your attitude towards forgiveness? And here's what he discovered based on this research, 1,500 people over, over a course of about 10 years. The clearest predictor of an early death was holding a grudge. And so the title of his study when he published it was very, very fitting. The title of it was this, Forgive to Live. You see, for those of you that something, someone has done something to you in your past and, and you do find it hard to let it go... Let me just ask you, what benefit is it for you to hold a grudge? Like, who is that helping? When you think about it and, and you kind of in your mind think about what you could say or what you could do to get back at the person that hurt you, who is that exactly helping? You've probably heard the old uh, proverb, no one really knows who wrote it, but Holding on to anger is like drinking a poison, hoping another person dies. Well, here's another way to think about it, kind of a more modern uh, example. I heard one of my preacher friends talked about this. Anybody ever played the game Angry Birds? Okay, well, I'm about to tell you what Angry Birds is. It is a, it's a game came out probably, I don't know, 10 years ago, and it was huge. About five years ago, every single person had this game on their iPhone or their iPad, and they played it all the time. And it, the game has a, kind of a strange premise. You've got these birds, and they're really, really mad. No one knows why they're mad. They're just really mad. And then you've got these pigs. And what the pigs do is they build these terrible structures. I mean, there's, they're, their structures make no sense, but, but the pigs just go and they build all these structures. And so the, the, the point of the game is that the, the birds who are angry are supposed to destroy the structures that the pigs build. And so you take your little finger and you slide it across the screen and you launch these birds across the screen and you punish these awful, awful structures. Now, here's what many people kind of miss in the game. What happens to the birds after they hit the structures? They blow up. They're just obliterated from the game. Like... Who would want to be an angry bird? You see, when you get angry at people, when you hold grudges at people, who does that exactly help? Because what it really does is it doesn't affect the other person. So you're mad at someone because they did something to you a long time ago. Do you think that that's really affecting that person? No, the only person that it's affecting is you. Here's the solution. This is what Paul says just a few verses later in the same chapter. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So first he says, in your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't give the devil a foothold. He's saying, if you want this, the devil in your head, then you get angry and you hold grudges. And then he goes on to say, but if you want to get the devil out of your head, then what you need to do is you need to forgive. Now, sometimes I, I read passages like this, and they just seem so nice and clean and simple. And maybe you read passages like this too, and it just, you just look at it and you just think, well, it can't be that easy. Paul doesn't really understand what I'm going through. Paul doesn't understand my situation. He doesn't know who's hurt me. He doesn't know about this relationship that I had. And he doesn't know how bad this person treated me. No. Paul doesn't have a clue about your life. But Paul was in prison when he wrote these words. He was falsely incarcerated, misjudged, misunderstood. And he's sitting in a cell. 
And yet what's ironic is that Paul is experiencing more freedom in jail than some of us do in our pews. Because Paul had decided that while he might be a prisoner of Rome, he was not going to be a prisoner of rage. And some of you, even though you walk freely in the world, you are a prisoner to the grudge that you're holding against someone else, and it could be years and years and years ago. And so the question is, is it helping? And then the second question is, what exactly do we do about this? Well, there's one clue found in this passage on the screen. It's a little word, as. Paul says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You see, forgiving can only come when we are forgiven. Or another way to put it is, you see, forgiven people spend less time focusing on what others did to them and a lot more time focusing on what Jesus did for them. You see, when you read the forgiveness passages in the Bible, what you will find is there's always a relationship between the vertical dimension of forgiveness and the horizontal dimension of forgiveness. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus says, If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Lord's Prayer, forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Matthew 18, this is how your heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Nearly every time forgiveness is brought up in the Bible, it is brought up in the context of you can only do the horizontal forgiveness when you fully understand the vertical forgiveness. And so the answer to forgiving somebody else is not to start with that relationship because you might say you know you just don't understand phil how bad this hurt is i I don't think i can forgive that person don't start there where you start is what exactly has god forgiven you of or you might think about this what what are you most grateful for when it comes to god's forgiveness of you like is it something you did a long time ago when you hurt somebody else and you're really glad that god forgave you of that Or is it this kind of secret sin of of, of lust that you have in your heart every day and you're really thankful for grace in that regard? Is it the way you handle your finances? What is it? You see, when you can fully grasp God's grace for your life, only then can you even come close to beginning to forgive somebody else. So let's be realistic. Two practical thoughts and then... I want to transition. First of all, forgiveness does not mean forgetting. When Jesus rose from the dead, he came to his disciples, and do you remember what he showed them? He showed them the nail scars in his hands and in his feet and on his side. The memory of Jesus' death wasn't erased from his mind after he rose from the dead. It's not, he didn't forget it. He just, see, it's not about forgetting, it's about foregoing your right to get even. Doesn't mean you're going to forget it. Secondly, forgiveness does not mean friendship. You see, friendship's a two-way street. If we're going to be friends, you're going to have to put forth effort, and I'm going to have to put forth effort, and and, if we're going to have this relationship, it's got to be a two-way street. Forgiveness is not a two-way street. Forgiveness is a one-way street. When you practice forgiveness, you're not concerned about healing the relationship. You're concerned about healing the person. You see, that's why you can forgive people that have already died. It's why you can forgive somebody else, and they might never know that you forgave them. You see, reconciliation, that's a two-way street. But forgiveness, it's a one-way street. Now, some of you might say, ah, I feel that's just not fair. If I do all this hard work of forgiveness and trying to, you know, work through this on my own, doesn't that person still deserve to pay for what they did to me? I mean, they said some terrible things to me, just like the example I gave earlier. This woman who saw the counselor I know for 50 years, she's been plagued by what her mother did to her when she was a child. Doesn't the mother deserve to pay for what she did? And the answer to that is yes, she does. But here's what forgiveness is. 
When you forgive someone, you are not saying you're off the hook. When you forgive someone, you're saying you're not on my hook anymore. You're on God's hook. You see, what you do when you forgive someone is very simple. You're transferring justice. Like, let me ask you, who do you think has a better sense of justice, you or God? See, Paul says this in, in Romans chapter 12. It's so helpful for those of you wrestling with this. Paul says, don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room, leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. You see, Satan wants to make room in your head for him, and God wants you to make room for God. And so the question is, who are you inviting into your mind? You see, when you forgive someone, what you're doing is you're simply deferring the, just, the justice to somebody else. That's all you're doing. Yes, the person still gets what they deserve, but it's not you who inflicts the punishment. It's the actual judge. And so what you're really doing when you forgive someone is you're placing your offender before the great judge so that you can place your heart before the great physician. You see, here's the truth. God can't heal your heart when you're holding a grudge. And so if you want your heart to be healed, you're going to have to hand over the grudge, the grudge to God. So that's forgiveness in theory. And so now what I want to do is invite someone up to the stage to help explain forgiveness, not just in theory, uh, but in practice. His name is Dan Lovejoy, and he's going to share uh, a story of, of how forgiveness took shape in his life. Good morning. My name is Dan Lovejoy. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus who struggles with perfectionism, abandonment, and many other issues. When I was eight years old, my birth father, Dan, left my mother for another woman. I didn't understand much about why that was happening. I just knew that our family was destroyed and we had to move. My father had, no, had visitation rights on Tuesday nights. He was supposed to pick me up from school. I remember at least two times he forgot and I waited him, for him for a long time in front of the school, holding my little French horn. The time I spent at his house on Tuesdays and sometimes on weekends felt uncomfortable. It was definitely not my home. It was clear that his new wife resented me and my sister. She was cruel to us. Soon my father married the new woman and my mother dated and married the man I now call my dad. I wish I could say everything was perfect in our new home, but it wasn't. I was deeply troubled, I struggled in school, and I resented my new dad. However, I can say that we always went to church, we always had nice things to wear, toys, and plenty to eat. And both my mom and my new dad were very supportive. They believed I could do anything I set my mind to, and they were very encouraging. And perhaps most important, they stuck around. They have always had my back. In fact, they're here today. I'm so grateful for my mom, my new dad, and the whole Lovejoy family I inherited through my new dad. In sixth grade, the oil bust really took hold in eastern New Mexico, and we had to move. We moved to a beautiful town in central Texas, but that marked the end of my relationship with my birth father. We usually got, child support, we usually got a child support check, but I can only remember one letter and one visit during the time I was in junior high and high school so about seven years. When I turned 18, the child support check came, but it was only half. It was for my sister and not me. They no longer had to pay for me. Somewhere in my father, my birth father's home, my birthday was on the calendar, but I didn't hear from them. I was a pretty smart kid, and I realize now that I wanted everyone to know, to know that because I felt worthless. I felt worthless because I had been abandoned by my father for a woman who is not very kind. In college, I reconnected with my father for a short time, but after college, I lived overseas. When his mother, my grandmother, died, I didn't find out till after the funeral. He told me that they were moving soon, and I told him to let me know where he was going to move and to give me a new phone number. I realized much later that his mother, my grandmother, had been responsible for the few times I had seen him over the years. 
So that was the last time I heard from him for 16 years. When I got married, I changed my last name to Lovejoy, the name of my new dad, we'll just call dad now, who stuck around. After I got married, I realized I couldn't talk about my birth father with my wife or really anyone. I hurt so much because I felt abandoned. I felt unworthy of love. I loved other people, but I really didn't understand what they said, what they meant when they said they loved me. I really had no friends of my own, just a few friends from college that had moved away, and then, of course, my wife's friends. I distrusted and disliked almost all men. I had just one emotion, anger. I either felt nothing or anger. I felt, I felt inadequate, worthless, and unlovable, all because I was holding on in all of this resentment and hurt from my abandonment. I didn't feel anything for God, and I didn't understand how he could love me. My resentment made me judgmental and unloving. It led me to unhealthy and sinful coping behaviors and deep unhappiness. That's when we turned the page. That's when I came to Celebrate Recovery. At Celebrate Recovery, I learned that I was not alone. I joined a step study, a year-long gender-segregated Bible study in which we talk about our deepest hurts and find healing in Jesus Christ. In my step study, I finally began to talk about the pain of my abandonment. I learned that I was not responsible for my abandonment, but I was responsible for my behaviors. I learned that my emotions were unreliable, but my God was not. Most of all, I learned that releasing the pain and resentment of my abandonment meant forgiving my birth father. Forgiveness didn't mean everything was okay. It didn't mean that I had to find him or even talk to him. But it did mean that I had to release the pain and resentment I had been carrying around. And I did forgive him. I don't want to give you the impression that this happened overnight. It was a process that I began in that step study and I worked on for many years. But that com complete forgiveness came. When forgiveness came into my life, a lot of things left. I lost my resentments. I learned how to like other men. I no longer have to prove I'm the smartest person in the room, usually. I, I learned how to talk to my wife, Angie, about my feelings, both my good and my bad feelings, and not resent her for wanting to know more about my life. Forgiveness allowed me to feel forgiven for all the wrongs I had done, and it made me a lot less willing to judge others. I felt compassion for other sinners, and I learned to extend grace. In November of 2013, I decided to look for my birth father. I searched for his name on Facebook, and there he was. I contacted him, and he told me he had just gotten on Facebook, hoping I would search for him. We have connected a few times in person and talk on the phone periodically. We are not close, but we are certainly reconciled. I'm so happy to report that he has found a deep faith in Jesus Christ, attends church regularly, and studies the Bible with a close group of friends. He has expressed deep regret and sorrow for the pain he caused me, and I can honestly say I no longer hold anger, pain, or resentment toward him. I'm just happy he's found Jesus. Life is not perfect. I still struggle with inadequacy. I struggle with my weight. I don't feel equal to the task of leading a great ministry like Celebrate Recovery. But I don't have to be up to the task because God is in the ministry and he has asked me along for the ride. I have men beside me to hear about my hurts, hangups, and habits. And I have an amazing wife who does most of the actual work. I also have a beautiful son and a beautiful family. Life is not perfect. In fact, sometimes life is really, really hard. But life is good and it's getting better. If you're wondering if Celebrate Recovery is for you, I have to tell you it probably is. If you're hurting from your own sin or from someone else's sin, someone else has hurt you, or from just a broken world, because we live in a broken world, you can come to Celebrate Recovery and find a safe place. If you're driving down the road and you run off the road into a ditch um, and you get out of the car and you push it and pull it and go back and forth and dig on it and you, you can't get out, you don't just say, oh, well, I guess I live in this ditch now. It's a good thing I brought a blanket. You call someone to get some help. 
And if you're in a spiritual ditch, I want to invite you to call someone. My phone number is on the front of the bulletin. If you want to call me, I'll put you, if you're a woman, I'll put you in touch with my wife. And I want you to come see us on Friday. You'll find a safe place where everyone respects your confidentiality and nobody will tell your story but you. You won't find any judgment, just people who want to hear your story and support you. Come join us. You won't regret it. So, so there you have it. Forgiveness is really messy, but it's absolutely worth it. So where do we begin? We begin this hard road of forgiveness through prayer. Remember the Lord's Prayer. Jesus prayed it first. Father, forgive us as we forgive others. So as we close, I would ask you to stand, and I'll lead us in a prayer and then offer an invitation. If you'll bow your heads. Our Father in heaven, we stand before you today as a people who have been hurt. We have placed our trust in a mom or a dad or a friend or a sibling, and they destroyed that trust. They have cut us deep. Some of us are betrayed, other of us, others are abandoned, some rejected, some feel unloved. Maybe it happened last week, maybe last year, maybe 50 years ago, but it's still there. And God, whatever power led Paul to forgive his jailers while he was in prison, we ask that you give that to us today. And whatever power led Stephen to forgive his murderers as they flung stones at his head, we ask that you grant it to us now. And whatever resolve Jesus mustered to forgive the Roman soldiers as they hung his body on a cross, we would ask you forgive that or give that to us as well. God, right now we pause and we bring to our mind the people in our life that we need to forgive. God, for the sake of your kingdom, we ask for your supernatural power to rain down on this room and release those held captive by their grudges. Give us hope. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, if you would like to give your life to Christ, we would like to offer you baptism. If you would like to give your burden to the church, we want to offer you prayer. If there's something we can help you with this morning, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.